Hey, guys. Well, it's uh, good to be back. Uh, if you don't know where I've been, <laughs> let me just tell you a little bit about that, and especially if you're a visitor and you've been here for the last three weeks and now you're thinking, who's this guy? Uh, my name is Jeff Vines. I am the senior pastor here at Christ Church of the Valley, and every year around the month of July, the elders uh, allow me to go away on what we call a study break. And uh, this is where I go to, to, to really uh, hear from God on where He wants to take our church in the coming season, the fall and next spring. And it just gives me a, a time to recharge my batteries and uh, to rethink. And, but, but primarily, folks, it really is to listen and, uh, to God and what He wants to do in my life and your life and the life of our church. So that's the reason I'm going to do what I'm going to do this morning and this entire weekend, and have been doing. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn over to Joshua chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading from verse 5 just in a moment. By the way, uh, jet lag is a terrible thing. Uh, and I noticed, you know, I used to be able to just go to Australia, then over to Africa, wherever, and come back and just pick up the next day, but as you get older, the body doesn't cooperate much anymore. And so, you know, like a couple of nights ago, I went to bed at 8 o'clock. I, I stayed up as long as I could. And I went into a deep sleep, and I woke up and said, it must be 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. It was 8.50. So 50 <laughs> minutes of intense sleep, and then you're just wide awake, aren't you? And then you, you, you just you, you need sleep. By, by the way, I, I don't ever watch TV in the middle of the night, but you got to do something, right, when you can't sleep. So I, I, uh, I started watching TV. You ever seen that movie, Million Dollar Baby? Okay, I've never seen that, but it won all kinds of awards. Let me just say to you, don't see that. That, that was the saddest movie I've ever seen in my life. I, I'm just in, we, we had 2.30 in the morning, you know. I'm just, my wife's in Thailand right now with my daughter. My family's not around. I'm in the house by myself. Don't, don't see that. That's a side note. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but don't, don't see that. It's too sad. Now, here's, here's what I'm going to do this weekend. I felt, when I was away in, I, in Australia, and I spent the first, uh, I think I spoke eight times in three days at a conference that they had sold out down there, just fabulous meeting with other pastors, other lay people. And then uh, I had some time to just speak with the Lord and listen. And this is what I feel like he wants me to do this weekend as we go into this series called The Blessed Life. I want to remind you, every single one of you, the calling on our lives, and I want you to stay with me through this. Because in Joshua, Moses, if you know anything about the text, is dead. God had given him a vision, and now he's passing that vision on to Joshua. And this is what he says. Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit a land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. And then in verse 9 he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, why do you think God gave me that verse while I was on my study break? You think he had a message for me? Let me tell you something. Every time God gives a vision in the Old Testament, there are four commonalities. Number one is this. The vision is always large. If it ain't large, it's not from God. If it's something you can do on your own, you don't need God. and It doesn't come from Him. It's probably a vision that has come from your own human ingenuity. When God gives a vision to any person or any church or any organization, it is always large, too. The vision always requires faith. It's so big that there's going to come a time when you think you can't achieve it, when there's no way it can happen. And it's at that point you're going to need faith and trust in who really makes the vision, who really puts legs on it, who really makes it happen, and that is God. If a vision does not require faith, it has not come from God, it's come from someplace else. Three, the vision always involves sacrifice. Nothing ever fantastic or great was accomplished without somebody saying, I'm going to put my life on the line, I'm going to get the blood flowing. I'm going to get the adrenaline flowing, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this a reality. No great vision has ever been accomplished without somebody willing to say, I'm willing to give what it takes. And four, and this is my favorite one, the vision is always incredibly exhilarating. That means at first it's a little daunting. It's big. Wow, can we do this? But after you get in the middle of it, and the, the juices are flowing, you know, and the adrenaline's flowing, you think, man, this is the first time in my life that I've really felt alive. I'm really doing something that matters. This is what life is about. 
Now, you see this through Noah as God calls him to build a boat, through Moses as he's called to lead the people out of Egypt, out of bondage, slavery, into the promised land, to Abraham as he's called to go to a land that God would show him and be the father of many nations. You see it in the same Uh, As David is going to slay a giant named Goliath, you see it in Nehemiah as he's called to build a city, and you see it in Gideon as he's called to defeat an army. But the greatest vision ever given to a man by God was what vision? Jesus, to go to the cross and redeem the world. Around here we talk about it like this, that we're over here, and that because we are sinners, that there's a gap between us and God. And the only way that we can cross over is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so our vision here at Christ Church of the Valley, and the vision of every church, and it never changes, is to bring people who are far from God near to God, and we acknowledge the only way that could ever happen is through the cross of Jesus Christ, where your sins are forgiven and you're placed in a right relationship with God the Father, and let the journey begin. Now that is the vision of every church, and if it's not, then they're in the wrong business. That is the vision of every church, and it never changes. To help people who are far from God move close to God. That's what Jesus did. He accomplished it through the cross. That's what we continue to do. Now, can I ask you a question just quickly? Is there any greater endeavor that you can invest your life in than that? Come on now. Is there any greater, is there anything that you could spend your time and energy on that is more important than bringing people who are far from God near to God? Anything at all? Now, there are other endeavors, but there's nothing more important, nothing more grand. There's nothing that has a greater sense of urgency. As a matter of fact, the first 300 years of church history, folks, think about it. God was moving in amazing ways, and it's because of this. They had moved from egocentrism to theocentrism. Before, they thought, the world is all about me and what I want and my desires. But that early church, they got it. They thought, it's not about me and what I want. It's about what God wants and who he is and how he's going to use me to accomplish his, pers- his purposes in the world. That he, all of history is his story, and i got to find the part I play in it. Because they were willing to make God the center of everything, God came and he moved in dramatic, mighty ways. Have you read those passages of scriptures where the captives were set free, the sick were healed, the brokenhearted were restored? There's a correlation that's related directly to our willingness to make God the center of our lives and his willingness to come down and do great things. And they knew that. That's why in Isaiah 61, Jesus It was prophesied that he would be this kind of person. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. Now, what amazes me, folks, is that although this happened many, many years ago, you still see this type of activity in the church today. Folks, do you know how hard it is to come in here? Do you know anything at all about Celebrate Recovery yet? If you don't, I feel sorry for you. Because every Monday night, they come into this room over here. Do you know how much courage it takes to say, I am an alcoholic. I am addicted to pornography. I have issues in my life, hurts, habits, hang-ups, and I need somebody to help me. And they're at the point when they realize that the only person who can help them is the power and the message of Jesus Christ. You know what that does? Listen, you will never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And that's why when we started our prayer meeting, we asked Celebrate Recovery to please come over and be the critical mass that would launch this prayer meeting where we go before the throne of God and in great expectation expect God to move. You know why we asked Celebrate Recovery to do that? Because we knew they would be a a catalyst toward the kind of prayer meeting that we really needed to have here for the hand of God to move in the life of our church. You will never know that Jesus is all you need until he's all you have. And once he's all you have, you will praise and you will be grateful and you will raise your hands in worship because you know without him, you could have never been rescued. I'm telling you, when I see Celebrate Recovery, I remember that we still are the church and God is still moving. But it goes beyond that, folks, far beyond that. In James chapter 1, we're told that this is true religion. This is the kind of religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. So as you look around Christ Church of the Valley, you see Celebrate Recovery, but you also see this church going out. We have a huge heart for single mothers. How many times have you heard me say that? Is it like a broken record yet? Then I'll keep repeating it until you get it. 
I'm going to say it over and over again. And just over the last couple of weeks, we've gone in in our house to home ministry and repaired the dilapidated homes of some single moms who need our help. The state of California has no desire or love for single mothers in this state. No help whatsoever. But our church does. And we want to go out and show the love of Christ to these moms and tell them, You should not feel unworthy. You should not feel unloved. We're not going to judge you. We're just going to be here to support you and to help you. And so we have people going out to to repair their homes. We had 26 people volunteer from our Lone Hill campus to go out and repair a home. Folks, there were some single moms who had been helped in the past, so they wanted to pay it forward. Somebody had helped them, so they showed up to help this new single mom. And now they saw that there was some carpet that was old and dilapidated. So rather than come to the church and say, we need some money to buy a new carpet, they just went right out and got it themselves, laid the carpet down and the kitchen repair and the bathrooms and the living room. And this single mom was so inspired. She actually posted pictures on Facebook, social media. Everybody's watching. This is the heartbeat of our church. And it's not only repairing the homes of single moms, it's also giving away new cars and used cars to parents and to single parents who need transportation. And our car ministry continues to flourish. Also, have you ever been to be a blessing? Ever been to be a blessing? The next one happens September 21st when this whole auditorium is converted into a place where we bring these single moms in and we just love on them, man. We give them a haircut, a massage. I don't do it personally, but there are people who do. Their their makeup, their outfit, because the gospel is a gospel of great love. And we want to do whatever it takes to convince these moms that they're loved, that they're wanted, that they're worthy. And we don't stop with mothers, folks. We keep going on. In Matthew chapter 19, the Bible says, people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he had placed his hands on them, he went from there. Because we believe that those who are addicted to something that is destroying them matter to God. Because we believe that Single moms matter to God because we believe that children matter to God. We started our kaleidoscope program. We're trying to go in every school that we possibly can, and we're asking the teachers and the principals about at-risk children. Who are the children who are at risk? You know what an at-risk child is? It's a child that without some help is probably not going to make it. And if he or she does make it, they're probably going to turn to a life of crime, something other than uh, being a responsible uh, uh, individual in in a growing, developing society. We figure at Christ Church of the Valley, if we can save the next generation, then our community will be a better place because Christ Church of the Valley was here. In fact, we ask that in every vision meeting that we have. The ultimate question for us is, if Christ Church of the Valley went missing, would anybody notice? Would anybody care? We think that what we need to be is the love of Jesus to our community, that we'd go into these schools and we'd take these young men and women and we would love them and we'd mentor them and we'd tutor them and we'd coach them and we'd tell them that we love them, that they matter to God, therefore they matter to us and that they have what it takes to be successful in the world. And if we can change a whole generation of children in this valley, then ultimately we will end up changing the valley. That's what we feel at this church that God has called us that people who are, have addictions stuck to them like Velcro that is destroying their marriages and their families, they matter to God. That single moms matter to God. That young people matter to God, therefore they matter to us. Now here's the key. Although those are some of the things, then you got the backpacks that we're trying to do, 4,000 backpacks. Then you got the thousands of people we feed at Thanksgiving. You got bumper bag that's trying to feed more and more people every week. But folks, that's not our vision, is it? Come on now. Meeting the social needs of our community is important because it opens the door to share what we really have on our heart. But our vision is not feed people. Jesus said the poor will always be with you. It is our responsibility to go out and meet those social needs. But our ultimate vision is this, and if you can't say it by now, I hope you can say it before you leave. We exist that there might be a fully devoted follower of Jesus in every home in the San Gabriel Valley. That is why we exist. Now, you look at that for a moment. When we first wrote that, we thought, wow, that's pretty big. Remember what I said about visions. If it's not big, it's not from God. That's going to require some faith. 
There's no way, though, that we can achieve this on our own. That's why we know unless we partner with other churches in the valley, this will just be a dream that never becomes a reality. That's why on Thursday and Friday, right here in this auditorium, we held the Global Leadership Summit. Anybody make our way out to that? How good was that, folks? You were able to hear some of the greatest speakers on the planet. Your life was going to be changed. If you didn't take advantage of that, I'm sorry. Hopefully you will next year. But we had pastors and other churches in this place with their congregations listening to great speakers, to be inspired, to take our communities for the cause of Christ. And if you miss that man, you miss an inspirational time. But for us, our primary vision, our primary vision is to have a fully devoted follower of Jesus in every home in this valley. Now stay with me. I believe this is what God wants for us as we start the fall. Folks, what is a fully devoted follower of Jesus? What is it? You cannot produce something that you are not yourself, right? So if we're going to have fully devoted followers in every home in this valley, I'm going to be assuming that all of us are fully devoted followers first because you can only produce what you yourselves are. And I think that I've mentioned this before, but I want to go over it again clearly. This is not something we just made up. We tried to go through the New Testament scriptures and ask the question, how would Jesus define a fully devoted follower to him? And here's how he defines it. Number one, gifts. Spiritual gifts. In Romans 12, verse 6, the Bible says, we have, and that means we all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us, and then he goes down a long list of what those gifts are. The Bible assumes that if you are a fully devoted follower of Jesus, that at some point in your life, you discovered that you have a gift given to you by God, a spiritual gift. That even though others might have the same gift that you do, no one expresses it quite like you do. That there is a masterpiece in you waiting to get out. That while you were in your mother's womb, God equipped you and shaped you. There is a gift that you have. There is a talent. There is an ability that only you have the way that you have it that God needs to get out of you so that the kingdom of God can go out in full force. We've talked about that the reason there's so many of us that are experiencing depression, that we're not happy the way we should be happy, is because we've defined happiness in a different way. In our culture, we define happiness as pleasurable satisfaction, something that makes us feel all ooey-gooey down on the inside. But the Bible defines happiness like this. It's the Greek word eudaimonia. And the Greek word eudaimonia translated happiness means this, to find your role in life and play it. Have you done that? Do you know what your spiritual gift is? Have you sought it? Have you sought accountability partners to help you identify it? And as you've identified, are you using it for the purpose of the kingdom of God? And if not, the Bible says you're not a fully devoted follower of Jesus until you find your role in the kingdom of God and you play it. Think about it. What would happen if everybody in this church discovered their spiritual gifts and used them for the purposes of Jesus? What would happen if everybody, everybody, Come on now. What would happen? Did you see the movie Hoosers? Anybody? Am I showing my age? Remember Gene Hackman? This is a movie based on the true story of a high school in Indiana named Milan High School. Now, it wasn't called that in the movie, but the real high school I've been there is Milan High School. They had a total of 68 students, 68, and they won the state basketball championship. Think about that. True story, 1952. Gene Hackman plays the coach. And he's got four of his players, but one is missing, Jimmy Chitwood, if you saw the movie. And Jimmy Chitwood just happens to be the best player. And Jimmy Chitwood will not play on the team because of some past hurts and hangups from another coach. Finally, Hackman talks him into playing. He huddles them together and he says, guys, without Jimmy, we weren't a machine. But with Jimmy Chitwood, all the pistons are firing and we will be unstoppable. You know, the Bible says something very similar. When everybody in the body finds their spiritual gifts and they discover them, and they play their role in God's kingdom expansion, then all the pistons are firing, and the church will be unstoppable. The church is the hope of the world when it's operating and functioning the way it's meant to function. When everybody discovers their gift, and everybody plays their role. If you haven't done that, I'm telling you, you're not a fully devoted follower yet, and I encourage you to go to ccvsoulcal.com slash serve and start the journey. Here's the second thing. Growth. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now stay with me, folks. I know this is a different kind of message. I know, but while I was away on my study break, it's like God reminded me, look, 
you're at a plateau now. And for us to go where God wants us to go, we got to take these things seriously. Every individual, not just 5, 10, 15 people, every individual. And the Bible assumes that a fully devoted follower of Jesus is always growing toward Christ's likeness. Are you growing toward Christ's likeness? There's no such thing as stagnation in spiritual growth. If you're standing still, you're not really standing still, you're moving backwards. And here's the reason. Because so much is imparted and put it into you through television, through movies, through what you read in the world, that if you're not getting the Spirit of God in you and the Word of God in you, if you're not renewing your mind, you're not only not moving forward, you're moving backwards. The Bible assumes that somebody who is a fully devoted follower of Jesus, they're assuming personal responsibility for their own spiritual growth. That there's something that they're doing that's causing growth. And there's so many opportunities for you around this place, man. Life groups, there are hundreds of them. That you can get in where you can hold each other accountable, where you pray together, where you study the scripture together, where you continue to grow through the renewing of the mind and the power of the word. There's Engage that we introduced earlier in the year. You can go online to ccvsocal.com slash engage and you'll take a spiritual survey and it will put you in a classification and it will tell you, okay, this is where you are presently for you to get here. Here's what you need to do. Here are the readings you need to read. Here's the way you need to spend time with God. Have you ever wanted to ask Pastor Jeff, Pastor Jeff, you know, we come every week and we listen to you sometimes, sometimes we don't, we just tune you out, but other times we do listen, but how do you grow? And I've mentioned there are ways that I grow. I love Philip Yancey, he's a great writer, I've read everything that he's written about the Bible. Uh, Dr. Ravi Zacharias is another one that I read, every book he's ever written, especially Cries of the Heart and Regaining the Wonder. Tim Keller I mentioned, Robert Alter I mentioned, these are guys that I read. I read the Bible first, it is my primary work, but I read great men of God who have been led of God and who continue to influence and impact me. As a matter of fact, there must be thousands and thousands of Bible devotionals, most of which are average at best in my opinion. But I found one that is very good, Chris T. Green. It's called Walking with God. And it's a devotion for every day of the year. This is my third time through it. Here's why. This guy writes with great depth. His theology is solid. And he always challenges me. There's not one boring devotion on this page. And I'm going through it for the third time. Because I know that if I'm not moving forward, not only am I not moving forward, I'm moving backwards. The Bible says the only way you can be conformed to the image of Christ is through the renewing of your mind. And I hope that at the very least, you'll walk out of here and say, I am going to assume the responsibility for my own personal growth and development. As a matter of fact, folks, you look around the room, you're going to have people with these bracelets on. Do you remember what that's about? This is about a message that we did a few weeks ago on the Nazarite vow. There are people wearing those right bracelets to remind the rest of us that they are coming clean with themselves, that there's something in their lives they know that they've been fighting for a very long time, and they're going to need a miracle of God. There's something in their lives that is keeping them from becoming conformed to the image of Christ, that God might use them in kingdom expansion. So they've said to God, as they've taken this 90-day vow, God, do whatever you have to do in me. Open my eyes. Help me see, but help me defeat this one thing that's defeating me. And on September 29th, on a Sunday night, we're all going to come in here with our white bracelets and we're going to bend our knee and we're going to worship for over an hour and say, God, what are you going to do in my life now that I've completed the vow that I've made to you? And here's why. We agree in this church that what you do, what you do is going to be greatly determined by who you are on the inside. What you do on the outside will be determined by who you are on the inside. And the question every person has to ask is this, What kind of person am I becoming? And if you're not growing toward Christ, you're growing away. Folks, have you guys heard what the men's ministry around here is doing? I'm I'm concerned about the men's initiative. I'm concerned that they're going to leave the rest of us behind. Because these guys are on fire. Dane Dane Johnson is leading these guys. They're actually doing a thing called spiritual boot camp. Can you imagine what that's like? Especially with Pastor Dane leading it. I fear for my life, and you should fear for yours. But at the same time, I know that he's on fire about the men in our church being better husbands, better leaders, better better parents, better fathers. Don't you, women, don't you want your husbands to be a better leader, a better father, a better parent? Don't you want them to be the man that God's called them to be? 
And there's a real move now in men's initiative around this church that they believe that something's trying to steal the heart of God away from them, that their heart is being distracted by things that really don't matter, by power, by money, by prestige, by women, whatever it is. And they've said, no, we draw the line in the sand right here. We know there's somebody that has come to kill and destroy, but there's somebody else who has come to give us life and give it to the full. So they get together in these group and they study Wild at Heart, which is a great book by John Eldridge that I probably read 10 years ago to remind you that God has wired you men in a specific way. And he wants you to be the leaders in your homes, the leaders in your community. He wants you to be a man of great faith and he's put something in you that until you discover it, until you find it, you'll never find the joy that Jesus came to bring. So they go away in these boot camps, these spiritual boot camps. They do these book studies together and they call each other to rediscover the heart that God has given them. Man, and they've just taken off hundreds of men And then the women aren't too far behind. They're not going to be outdone. The women's ministry continues to explode around here. Great teachers, Beth Moore, great visiting speakers, great people coming in, great small groups, great discipleships. They're doing all kinds of new book studies, Bible studies. They're doing retreats, which I like to call advances. And they're also doing this thing called Pilates, which I have no idea what it is, but it must be spiritual. (laughs) And so I'm saying to you, you have to assume the responsibility to grow. A fully devoted follower discovers his or her gifts and uses them in the kingdom of God. A fully devoted follower assumes the responsibility for their own personal growth so that when we come in here, we're experiencing, we're verbalizing, we're worshiping because God is moving us from here to there. Third, quickly, giving. Now here's what we believe at Christ Church of the Valley. We believe the Bible teaches this according to 2 Corinthians 9, 6, that whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. We believe in the principle of the sower, that when you sow, you reap later than you sow and more than you sow. A fully devoted follower really involves three things underneath this category, and that is one, they have a singularity of vision. They know what their calling is. They have a driven resolve to make sure the calling becomes a reality and a primary objective and mission. That has to do with the specific or particular vision God has given them through the ministry of their church. Now, I want you to listen to me for a moment here. This is not a giving sermon, so you can wipe the sweat off your brow. Ooh, that was close. (laughs) But it is to say that a fully devoted follower of Jesus, according to the Scripture, not only discovers their spiritual gifts, not only assumes responsibility for their growth, but they see that God gets the very best of who they are. The first fruits of their lives go to God. Here's why. Because that which we treasure the most, that's what will get our attention, right? Whatever we treasure the most, if we truly treasure the expansion of Christ's kingdom, that's going to get the very best of who we are in our time and our talents and, yes, our resources, Let me give you an example, folks. I've shared this before. In order for us, I just want to be blunt here and then I'll move on. In order for us to have a fully devoted follower of Jesus in every home in this valley, that means every single one of us has to discover our gifts and use it. It means every single one of us has to grow in our relationship with Christ. But it also means that we got to move beyond the 13% who are presently tithing at CCV, 13% to 100%. Let me show you what we could do if we did that, just quickly. If, based on the average household income, and we've done this before, of what the typical person or family makes in this area, and I know it's a tough economy, I'm taking that for granted, but God has given us so much here. The question is not, is God going to give it? The question is, are you going to give what God's given you? Right now, our annual budget is about six and a half million. You say, wow, that's a lot of money. Do you know the ministry that's going on? Do you know what all is happening around this place? But if we gave what we're capable of giving, our annual budget would be somewhere around 30 million. 30 million. If we gave what we're capable. But that would mean more than just the 13% are tithing and giving the first fruits of their ministry to the ministry of Christ. Let me give you an example of what can happen. <clears throat> somebody showed me a photo of this. <clears throat> I, I can't remember if it was Dana or Dana, but somebody showed me this. And this is not a worship center, this is a care center. It's in Willow Creek in Chicago. It's something I shared with you about four years ago, but they beat us to it. Well, good for them. It's a place that you go into, and if you need food, 
you're going to find food. If you need produce, you're going to find produce. If you need clothing, you're going to find clothing. Whatever it is you need, there's a huge warehouse called the care center that anybody who is in need can go into and get the things they need. Now, the problem with us is we're so cynical. and We say, well, there are people who are going to take advantage of that. Hey, we've gotten pretty good around CCV of spying out those who are trying to take advantage of us and those who are in genuine need. Our systems are pretty doggone good. And let me tell you something. There are people in our community that are in genuine need, that are trying to work, that are trying to make ends meet. They're not lazy, and they're not trying to get a free lunch. They just need help. And it has been our dream for the last four years that we would have a huge warehouse as a care center where people could come and get groceries. They could get food and clothing and counseling, financial counseling, whatever it is they need, especially from us to get them back on their feet, that they might be a productive member of our society again, that they might have hopes and dreams and a future. That is the calling of the church. And I'm telling you that if 99.9% rather than 13% return to the Lord what rightfully belongs to him, that this would only be the beginning point, a care center. We could have kaleidoscope in every school so that every at-risk children is ministered to and is counted on and is valued, and we could tell them that you have what it takes to be successful in the world. CCP, instead of, instead of sponsoring 230 children in the slums of Kenya, we could take every child in that slum and make sure every child had a hope and a future an education, heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We could adopt every child and we'd change the slums overnight almost, folks. What we could do there if we all gave. India, every pastor that ministers with Ajay Law and sacrifices their lives for the cause of the gospel among nations that are just very militant toward the gospel. We could house these pastors. We could at least give them a home and three good meals a day as they go out to fight for the cause of Christ. We, what, what we could do in Rwanda, you'll remember my friend Anastas, who translates for me in the prisons of Rwanda. Don't let these clothes fool you guys. Fool you guys. These pastors live hand to mouth. This is probably the only set of clothes that they own. They got them and they were able to come to the conference. But these guys live in very small areas, don't know usually where their next meal's coming from. These guys live hand to mouth and yet they're so committed to the cause of Christ. If we were given the way we could, we have so many visions. I would just like to get this guy a truck. He travels all throughout Kigali. The guy has no transport. He's, very, he's got a family of three or four kids. They live in a very simple place, barely make ends meet, seldom have electricity. I'd love to just get this guy a vehicle so that when he goes out to minister to these pastors, he wouldn't have to take the bus that is so, so undependable. I wish we could get internet is now in Rwanda. I would give anything. It's not affordable by anybody, but it's there. I, I'd give anything if we could set up an internet cafe in Kilgali for Anasos and all these pastors to be able to come and learn from people like John MacArthur and read the commentaries and study resources and Andy Stanley and some of the greatest speakers and teachers. We have access to that. All I got to do is push a button on my computer and I can read anything. These guys got nothing. Imagine what we could do for a small price. Set up an internet cafe and let these pastors come and learn the word and learn from great teachers and be better equipped to go out and do the work of ministry. What we could do. I'm talking about even our children. I mean, it's no good to do what we're doing overseas if we don't care about what we're doing right here. And we want to continue to improve our facilities for our children, that they would have a place that excites them, that they would learn the truth of the Word of God, that the next generation might come to Christ and be responsible for the next. And then finally, in Matthew 28, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. A fully devoted follower discovers his or her spiritual gifts, uses them in the expansion of Christ's kingdom, assumes responsibility for their own spiritual growth, daily devotionals, whatever it is they're doing, but they're growing closer to God every day. They give back to God what rightfully belongs to Him. It's a great deal. He says, Everything comes from me. You keep 90. I just want 10. Pretty good deal. Pretty good deal. And fourth, we go. Now, there's no website for this one. It's the Great Commission. What would happen if every person in this room had one life they were investing in? Just one. What would happen if every person who attends CCV brought somebody to Jesus within the next three to five years? What would happen? 
You think I'm going to say we'd be a church of 12,000. Well, that would be true. But if every person here brought somebody that was far from God, when you bring somebody who's far from God, chances are you have access now to a whole new community that's far from God. Right? When you bring one, the others are sure to follow. But it's investing in that one life. When I was in Australia, I did a conference at a place called Highway Christian Church. Amazing conference. The pastors, Byron and Ann, this is Byron. After I'd preached those eight times in three days, he got up and told his story, and it was so powerful. Raised by an alcoholic father, he learned to do two things, work hard and drink hard, and that was his life. He would work until four or five and drink, go right to the pub and drink till midnight, one o'clock, get up and do it all over again. By the age of 19, he was an alcoholic and addicted to about every drug you can imagine. He was at the end of his rope, <clears throat> no way out, and somebody noticed. And somebody invested in Byron and told him about the love of Christ, took him to church, walked him right in, and Byron found God and the power of the Spirit to overcome. Byron and his wife planted a church on the Gold Coast of Australia with about 10 people, and today they have the largest church on the Gold Coast of Australia. And he is an amazing, humble man. You know why? Because he's been rescued. Because somebody invested in him when no one else would. Don't fall for the lie that people today are not open to the gospel. It's a lie. What they're not open to is you shoving it down their face. They want somebody who's going to love them first, invest in them first. But everybody, most people rather, are open to anybody who wants to show them the love of a God who will be actively involved in their lives. And one of the greatest evangelistic tools we have is to bring them to a place where they see people who believe that God is here in this place. When there's an awareness of God, people are drawn in. It really amazes me, folks, about the whole seeker movement where we think we have to water things down and where we think we can't be too serious or it'll run people away from God. <laughs> the opposite is true. When people come in here and they see people who are fired up about God, they don't have to understand everything that's going on. They just want to see a group of people who actually believe that God is real and that God moves. And when they see that, their hearts will be pulled and compelled toward a loving Christ. Go. Here's what I want to ask you to do. If you have not discovered your spiritual gift, leave today and sign up. ccvsocal.com slash serve. Go into one of our spiritual gift classes and help let others help you discover your gift and get you involved in playing your role in ministry. If you're not growing right now and you know that, I think you can pick this up for $6 at Barnes & Noble up in uh, Glendora. Or go online to engage if you don't want to spend any money. Go online to engage. Start, start your journey. But do something. <clears throat> Give. If you're not giving yet, this is just as important as the others. Give. You can go online to ccvsocal.com slash give. You might have to do what I do. There's no way I trust myself to give to God what rightfully belongs to him at the end of the month. Because if I have money left over and I see golf clubs, well, you know the rest of the story. So I tell the ladies upstairs in our finance department, look, I don't even want to see it. It doesn't belong to me anyway. Just take it off the top. Take it away and then write the check of what's left. That's the only way I could do it. And some of you are not disciplined enough and you're never going to do it unless you do it like that. Some of you need to go online and just fill out automatic and it automatically comes out and there you go. What belongs to God, he gets. And what you get, you get. Until some of you do that, we'll never move past 13% of us tithing what God gives us. And finally, go. Andy Stanley says this, and I wish it had come originate from me, but it didn't. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. You can't help everybody, but you can help one. You can't help everybody in your community that needs help with food, clothing, but you can help one. You can't lead everybody to Christ in the world, but you can designate one. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And if our whole church lived by that, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his kingdom would be expanded in this valley and we'd have a fully devoted follower of Jesus in every home. Now here's how I want to end. There's no closing song, so you're going to get out on time. Give me three minutes. Here's how I want to end. I want to tell you what's happening this fall. I never get to do this with you, you know. I always come out on the weekend, I preach, and we're in a series. I never just get to talk to you like this. So I, I don't know if you've enjoyed it, but I, I sure had a good time. 
I want to talk to you. I want to tell you what's on my mind and what God put on my mind. You're, you're the church, man. We, we, are, we are together in this. Here's what God put on my mind. Sometime this fall, we've not designated the date, but sometime this fall, I'm going to start a series, and I'm going to preach through the major narratives of the entire Bible. It's probably going to take me a year. We're going to start in Genesis and go all the way through the Revelation. Now, we can't take every verse because you know that takes take us a lot longer than a year. But I'm going to preach on every narrative. It's going to be called the story. And I'm going to preach on every major narrative. And if you dedicate yourself to come, within the next year, you're going to understand the entire Bible and how it's all connected. So that's going to be good for you. But it's also going to be good for your unchurched friends. Because what I find, and even people who reject Jesus as Savior, still want to know what the Christians believe and what the Bible teaches. You tell them that your pastor is taking you through the entire Bible. I'll announce that plenty ahead enough time so that you'll know when it all starts and you can invite your friends. Every major narrative, starting with creation. And then I'm going to finish that with my own series on the book of Revelation. I've been here five years. I believe I've earned the right to preach on that book now. And so... I, and it'll be six years at that point, and then I'll take you through Revelation, so stop sending the emails asking me when I'm going to do that. And I'll do that, and it'll start about this time next year, or maybe a little later. That's the first thing. Second thing is this. We realize that uh, we all have a different taste when it comes to worship. We know that. At uh, Lone Hill, it's a little different over there. It's uh, a little bit more acoustic style of worship. On Sunday nights, it's a little different. Uh, we have longer extended worship, about 40 minutes. And we have longer ministry time because we're not pushed for time in between services. So we have a longer, so there's a Sunday night crowd that really follows that. And that crowd's really growing because that's what they want. More worship and less talk. So they get more worship and more talk. And so they come on Sunday night. <laughs> now, in the last five years, these are the times, you know, I always like to go, I've been your senior pastor for over five years. And there are some things that takes me a while to realize. But I know that I think we're still missing a group. And so on 8.30, 8.30 on Sunday mornings, we're going to do a different style of worship over in the fireside room. And this is going to be a style that is, it's more classic. Because I know there, I, 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 I'm just concerned that maybe, you know, would my mom and dad come to CCV? Well, you know they would because their son's the preacher. But would they enjoy it? And I think that we're still missing a certain group of people who like more of a classic time worship. So at 8.30 on Sunday mornings, we're going to offer that right over here in the fireside room. And I want you to know that's coming. And then finally, and this is very, very important, especially for you. I have got to do something to get some of you to move out of 10 and 11.30 to Saturday night. I've begged and it hasn't worked well. And the reason is, is because at this time at 1130, we're so packed that when new people come, they still come and they drive around and just leave. Because they can't either find a park or they kind of peek in and it's kind of daunting to them. They look in here and say, man, I don't oh, know, this is too busy. So here's what we're going to do. And I know some of you can't, and I'm cool with that. I'm only talking to those of you who can. Some of you work on Saturday nights, not an option. Okay, fine, that's fine. But for those of you who can, Saturday night is going to become family night. And that means we're going to do everything we can to make it so special for the kids that you're going to have a hard time not coming. Because your children are going to hear what's going on and say, Mom, why can't we go on Saturday nights? And you're going to have to give an answer. <laughs> and that's the position we hope to put you in. So we'll let you know when it starts, but coming this fall, Saturday nights are going to change. The service is still the same, but everything that goes around the service, the food and the activities, we're really going to target your children. So that they want to be there. And then I know, I know, they'll get, if I can't get you there, your children can. And so we're, we're counting on that. And finally, finally, quickly, and then I'm done. i got to be quick. Finally, uh, prayer meetings. If you haven't attended one, please come. 6.30, the first Monday night, because that's where things are really happening around this place. And that's where revival is happening, and that's where I believe God is going to move us into the future. All right. Don't forget, next week we start Blessed Life series. Uh, you don't want to miss this series because while our salvation is secure, I do believe there are things taught in Scripture that if we're willing to put them into our lives, it opens the gates of heaven and God pours His blessings on us. And I don't know any person that does not want to be blessed in their work, in their marriage, in their finances, whatever it is. Don't miss this series. God bless you. I hope you have a great weekend. <laughs>